Thank you, doctor. I'm so impressed with that introduction. I can't wait to hear what I have to say. First, let me say what a pleasure it is for you to be here to listen to me. Is there anybody here from New Jersey, by the way? Okay, I'll talk slower. You know, I always make sure that people get my message. I have been looking forward to giving this talk since 8.15. And the reason I'm looking forward to giving talks like this is because groups like this have a common thread of purpose that unite all of you. All of you here want to make a difference. The people in this room are joined together. I don't care what your position is. You are here to make a difference. Now, there's a critical mass of information that's coming at you because of a particular word. Now, that word, you heard it this morning, has been on the lips of a lot of people. Children seek it, politicians claim it, prosecutors investigate it, and judges sentence it. I've been fascinated with organizations, what made them tick, how come some are successful, how come some aren't. So I'm here to perform a marriage between the theory and the practice of that word leadership. When I started to do this research and, and, and do this book, and I looked at that critical mass of information, I found out that in 1992, 200 books were written about leadership. In 1997, 600 books were written about leadership. This is a tool. There are 250 definitions of the word leadership. They've all, these, these, all of these books had suggested 9,000 different ways of leading people. That's one of them. Either that's a chart on leadership or it's the cutoff of the highway in California. Okay? So, the basic premise that I'd like to share with you today, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna convince you as I would a jury, that the way I espouse about leadership is the best way. Now, out of that 250 definitions of leadership, I boiled it down to something we could all deal with. Leadership is about power, the people who have it, and what they do with it. Leadership is about power, the people who have it, and what they do with it. King Arthur, at court one day, a lady had dropped her garter. Not a very nice thing to have happened. And everybody laughed at her, and she was tremendously embarrassed. King Arthur walked over, picked up the garter, held it up, and said, Honey Swaki Molly Pence, shame on you who think evil of her. This will become the highest order of the land. The highest knighthood you could get in England is the Knight of the Garter, what they call a KG. In Brooklyn, we call him a known gambler, but in England, it's a KG, a Knight of the Garter. Now, I make sure that people get my message. I make sure, you know, in the 60s, we met with Manfred Schreiber, the chief of police in Munich, who had the Munich Games that defended the Israelis. And he told us about, this is when hostage situations first became a police problem. And he told us about the mistakes they made. We developed a hostage training program early in my career on, uh, for police commanders. And it was at Floyd Bennett Field and it was from nine to five. We had a psychiatrist there, we had uh, strategy people there. We never started till 9.30 because everybody got lost. 
So I called the audiovisual unit and I said, make me signs with arrows on it. Because I wanted to hang those arrows on the fence would point you to where the, the hanger was. And that's what he did. He, he sent me six signs with, arrow, with arrows on it. Ever since then, I said, I got to learn how to get people to take my message. So <clears throat> the fact that you're here tells me you're comfortable with having your views challenged. Well, get comfortable. My job here today is to get you to think about something different, to put a mirror in front of yourselves and take a look at what you're doing. I'm going to pepper this with questions, questions you ask yourself. Uh, so that word leadership is on the, let me connect some dots. The instrument that you're going to use to manage your, 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 your organizations, I don't care what you do, a sergeant in the police department can manage people in, can supervise people in the Air Force, at NBC. Leadership skills are fungible. Leadership skills are fungible. Um, the instrument you're going to use is, is leadership. That's what we'll do. Now, what are you facing? Let me tell you what you're facing. A recent survey by government officials say they're only working, well, government employees, I'm sorry, say they are only working at 60% of capacity. Government employees said this themselves. 45% say they hate their boss. They hate their boss. An HMO in Michigan said the single cause for absenteeism in the workplace is headaches caused by supervisors. A good day for workers is when their boss calls out sick. Now that's the kind of banana peel that you're going to have to work up traction on. And that there's a word that's coming out at you that's got a bullet in it, and it's called accountability. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if I could say to you, you're going to be able to get 40% out of what you have if you lead them. Now, I, uh, there was a study of uh, Gallup did a poll of 80,000 leaders, and they interviewed them on tape, and they wanted to know about leadership skills. And I listened to a lot of them. And the one portion that I found was that these leaders take care of the people who work for them. Do you take care of the people who work for you? Now, the people in your chair are the ones that are going to have to do that. My wife and I were at a movie in Vermont, and the movie was out of focus. And I said to my wife, the movie is out of focus. And my wife said, shh. I said, the damn movie is out of focus. I'll go up and tell them. She grabbed my wrist because she'd rather go blind than be with me when I made a scene. And she said, Someone else will tell them. <laughs> now when people say to me, what's the stupidest thing you've ever done in your life? I watched the whole movie out of focus. <laughs> We're waiting for someone to come along and make it better. Guess what? That's you. Now, my aim here is for you to return to your jobs 
grab your responsibilities by the lapels and say, I'm going to change this shit. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that Brooklyn comes out of me every once in a while. I'm going to change that. Now, I have used every leadership style you could possibly think of. I've done all the failing for you, all the success. I know what works. I'm here to tell you about what works. I was liberal, I was democratic, I was soft, I was tough. Nobody was tougher than I was. I once promoted someone before I fired him so he would lose a better job. You can't get tougher than that. The only thing I did was I made people afraid of me. Is that what you do? An army that's afraid of its own general doesn't win many battles. Years ago when you worked for J. Edgar Hoover and you wrote him a memo, he didn't send you a memo back, he wrote along the sides of the margin. And you got your memo back with his comments. They had a new secretary who forgot the rule about having a wide margin. And he had a scribble. And Hoover wrote, watch the borders. Some of you haven't gotten it yet. I'll wait another minute. They put the entire Mexican and Canadian office of the FBI on full alert. And someone said, what the hell are we looking for? You don't ask J. Edgar Hoover, what? People were terrified of J. Edgar Hoover until some controller said, we don't even have a case to write off all his overtime. Uh, so, an, an army that is afraid of its own general doesn't win many battles. How many of you here have books on leadership and management? Raise your hand. Marvelous. Throw them away. <laughs> Go back and throw them away. If you want to be a good musician, you listen to good music. If you want to be a good actor, which... <laughs> doesn't exist today, but I don't want to go there. Um, you will look at good acting, preferably in black and white movies, but anyway, you will look at good acting. If you want to know about good leadership, you should read biographies. How did they do it? Go back to taking care of, you'll see that theme in biographies, from Lee Iacocca, Iacocca how he turned Chrysler around, to Toscanini. I spoke to an NBC violinist who said, I never played that good until I played for Toscanini. Do people who work for you say that? I never worked that good until I worked for so-and-so. So, those people turn people on. Now, let me, I want to use this theme from the beginning to end. So if I'm saying that you ought to pick a style of leadership, the style I recommend to you is rather simple. Who gets the very best out of people? Can anybody give me a job that gets the very best out of people? Coaches and conductors. Coaches and conductors get the very best out of people. So, let me, I don't know if we're going to do this. Uh, I'm in a time constraint here. So, there comes a time when submarine captains and governors and sheriffs have to manage change and change their course. 
Now, when you manage change in government, you will run into my wife's roast beef. When we got married, my wife used to cut off the ends of the roast beef. And I said, what do you do that for? I like the ends of the roast beef. She says, well, my mother cooked it that way. We put it in the pan, the juice comes out. And my mother cooked it that way. And my mother-in-law, I said to my mother-in-law one day, I said, do you remember when you cooked uh, roast beef? Why do you, oh, she says it fit in the pan. She says the ends, juice came out. And that's the way my mother cooked it. My mother-in-law's mother was still alive. And one day I said, do you remember when you cooked roast beef? She said, yes. I said, why did you, cook, why did you cut off the ends? She said, oh, I could never get it in my pan. Now, sometimes we're doing the same things with greater conviction. The question is, what works? Why is there a group of Girl Scout sellers selling cookies that sell more than anybody else? Why, when this lieutenant works, people stay late, they work overtime, they don't put it in for it? Why, what quality does he have that we can bottle? So I've been fascinated with organizations. What made them tick? Why were some successful and were not? You have to start looking out of your own organization. Instead of looking at a sheriff's office or a school, you have to start looking at what other organizations are doing and adapt it to your organization. How are we organized? Uh, we're going to go kind of slower than I thought here. So if you see all of these books, you will see that they developed about 9,000 uh, systems of work that they suggest to you. So once again, there is a critical mass of organization. Uh, if you remember that, that was Johnny Carson. When, uh, when I left Harvard, we had a uh, a surprise for the professors at Harvard, and I played Johnny Carson, Carnac, I don't know if you remember that, where there was an answer in the envelope, and it, I, they gave me a headband, and I opened it, and it said six months, six months, and the question was, how much experience do all of the professors at Harvard have? So that taught me that leadership is not an academic experience. The examples of leadership, the examples of leadership can only be found in its practice. The examples of leadership can only be found in its practice. You must read biographies. How did they get it done? I spoke to an NBC violinist, said he never played the violin that good until he spoke to Toscanini. How did Lee Iacocca turn Chrysler around? These are the things you must look at. The Gallup organization, again, told me that you must look at the, what can I use that they're using in business, academic life, and government that we could use in, in this practice. Uh, these people were very instrumental in learning a lot of things. I had recommended these books. Uh, take a look at this. I know I'm on a constraint. I said that already. Let me... Uh, you know, we're, 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 uh, something is happening to us. Who we're looking up to? Uh, years ago, it was Aristotle contemplating the bust of Plato. Who do we look for guidance today? Who do we look for guidance today? Here we have Rosie O'Donnell looking up at Oprah. These, these are, we're looking at people who have fame. Fame without accomplishments, okay? This is what people are looking at. And you have a hard row to get people 
to follow you in an organization. Uh, I have to, uh, l let me just tell you that this little talk I'm going to give you was taken from a 15-week course on leadership uh, to a three-hour seminar and now down to about an hour. So I'm going to go fast because uh, we're in a time constraint. It does not matter what the product or the service is, any organization can be made better. Any organization, you must measure outcomes. Anybody who's running an organization and is not looking at, uh, not looking if it's a, a law enforcement agency and you're not talking to victims, if it's a car wash and you're not looking, talking to the people who've had their cars watch, washed, then what you're doing, you're not going uh, looking at the results of your business. Leadership is growing and enhancing. Leadership is growing and enhancing. Um, management is arranging and telling. I love to tell the story that when I was in the Army, they assigned a convicted arsonist to my platoon. A convicted arsonist. I made him the flamethrower. I don't know why people laugh at that. Shall I follow him around, see if he's lighting matches? Okay. Those leaders that I listened to said they don't put in what was left out. They pump what, what's in and they make it better. Okay, they make it better. You are talent hunters. One of the skills of leaders is you must look for the talent in your agency. One of the things that I've done is that I've done a skills inventory. A skills inventory. To see what kind of skills, you know, people have all their chess players, their boating, their shooting enthusiastic, their drinkers, their wife beaters, whatever the skill is, they have it. And so I remember we had uh, two people tied up, uh, three people tied up in, in ropes. And uh, we never cut the knots. And we found out that because one of the detectives had a boat, he says, that's a boat that used, that was a bowling knot. That was a boat, that was a, a, a rope that was used on boating. We got four suspects. We started to question them. We said, what'd you do this weekend? I was with my girlfriend. What'd you do this weekend? I went to the movies. What'd you do this weekend? I was on my boat. Oh, yeah? We'd like to have a chat with you. So, um, arranging and telling. The most common theme in winning organizations is the liberation of talent. Here comes another one. Do you liberate the talent in your organization? I love ideas. When people in your organization say, I have an idea, these are people you want working for you. Let them find their ideas. Let them seek it out. Move the goalpost. Move the, how many people in this room are patient people? Right, raise your hand if you're a patient person. Raise your hand if you consider yourself to be, good, get out. Leaders are not patient people. Learn how to be impatient. Impatient people achieve more in a quicker time. They get it done sooner. I say to somebody, when can you have that done? Oh, I can get it back to you in two weeks. What? Well, if you need it right away, I can, I can do it in a week. A week? Oh, look, if it's a rush, I can get it in a couple of days. A couple of days, I'll have it in 10 minutes. Hey, thanks. <laughs> Learn how to be impatient. People make mistakes in your organization. Let me show you the kind of power that I use <clears throat> in my organization. 
I eliminated the word mistake. I do not use, I sent out a memo, an email, do not use the word mistake. I replaced it with the word pizza. Why pizza? Everybody likes pizza. So people come into my office and they say, I made a pizza. You think they're going to come in and say, I made a mistake? What do you do with your mistakes? You bury them. And then when your employees make so many mistakes, the guy who replaces you fixes it. So you got to let people come in, and that has been such a successful thing, a small thing like that, changing the word mistakes. We don't make mistakes. It's not called a mistake. It's called a pizza. Even with the table of organization, all of you have the wedding cake table of organization. You know what that says? He's in charge. I take that table of organization and I turn it this way. It says, he's leading versus he's in charge. It may not seem like a lot, but it's a mindset. You communicate mindsets. You communicate mindsets. How am I doing with time? Um, orthodox, I want to go fast. Leadership is an action. Leadership is an action. Also, not taking an action is an action. You've decided not to decide. Now, the matrix for a good decision is thus. Is this a decision I have to make now? Do I have all of the information? And what are my options? Now, there's lots of books on decision making. I've boiled it down for you. If you look at those three and stay with those three, you will make not great decisions, not poor ones, but steady good ones. Let me give it to you one more time. Is this a decision I have to make now? Sometimes you don't have to make that decision. Do I have all the information? What are the options? Sometimes you don't have all of the information, but you got to act now. Sometimes deciding not to act is a decision. We have an old adage in Sicily. A fish starts to smell from the head. If it's not working, you're going to be replaced. And that's all there is to it. You better take action now. Do you empower others? A lot of people feel that I'm going to keep the power to myself. That makes me powerful. You have to come to me. Now, that's absolutely 180 degrees wrong. The more power that you give to the people who work for you, the more powerful you are. Now, power is the basic energy that transforms your intention into action. How many people in this room are afraid to use their power? Because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble. Now, I had a, a, a guy who was arrested six or seven times for DWI. He kept on getting longer suspended sentences because he was friendly with the judges. So on his last one, I had his car taken apart. We could keep his car for 48 hours. Boy, you got to see what two mechanics can do to a car in 48 hours. I even authorized overtime. We put it in a big bin. I called a press conference. We rolled it out of the garage. The guy wanted me arrested for malicious mischief to his car. I was in trouble. The mayor said, I got an out of control police commissioner. I said, no, you got a pissed off commissioner. This guy's gonna kill somebody and we're gonna stop it. 
Well, mad came to my aid, sad came to my aid. I wound up being a hero. That guy moved out of town. So sometimes you get a good, uh, you use your power. You use your power as a bully pulpit, okay? As a bully pulpit. Leaders don't pick up garbage. Leaders don't educate children. Leaders don't police the street. Ethics is something else we don't talk about. Let me tell you that more and more, each and every one of you should call your groups together and look at where the corruption has its are. You gotta say the word corruption to employees. Where it's in purchasing, it's where. I mean, where are the corruption hazards? When I was secretary of DJJ, kids were, kids were going to the bed hungry at night. I walked into one of my kitchens and the back door led out to the employee parking lot. I walked over to a grilled cheese sandwich. I said, kids were, were telling me, hey, I'm hungry. I'm not getting enough food. I opened up a grilled cheese sandwich and I said to the cook, when you're at home, one slice of cheese. I said, when you're at home, how many slices of cheese do you put in a grilled cheese? He said, three. I said, when my wife isn't home, I put in five. <laughs> that cheese was going out to the back door in the employee parking lot, and that's where the cheese was, and so were the roast beefs. So if you don't address ethics, and talk about it and bring it up. It's not something, and if you confuse ethics with brotherhood, then you're making a big mistake. You have to talk about ethics, you have to bring it up, and it won't bite you on the ass. Because when one of your employees gets arrested for a corrupt activity, you're gonna go too, okay? you're going to go through. How do you take care of your employees? Okay, you must take care of employees. When I got to Rikers Island, I was appointed by Mayor Giuliani in 95, and uh, my chief of staff came in with, what do you call that when everybody signs their name? Petition. 1,600 officers signed a petition. What did they want? The locker room Raw sewage was going into the locker room. So I said, what do you mean raw sewage? Are you telling me raw sewage is what I think it means? He says, yes. I said, well, how do they do it? Well, they bring chairs from home and they put grease on their nose and they get dressed and they, they... I says, how long has this been going on? 15 years. How long has that warden been there? About 12 years. I said, okay. I'm going to fix it. He said, and he said, look, don't worry about it. Every commissioner gets this, this uh, petition. So I says, okay, I'm going to fix it tonight. The ceiling became interesting. Very simple. At midnight, I transferred the warden's office into the locker room. He fixed it in three days. Called my office up and said, I want to pipe music in. Uh, got a locker doctor, fixed the lockers. Uh, had a new floor put in. He had 3,600 inmates. He had all the free labor in the world. And then he called my office. He says, what, um, we're going to pipe music in. What kind of music would you like? I said, the theme from Rocky. One of the best days in my life. Six o'clock in the morning, by the way. I went out to Rikers Island and got a standing ovation from the employees. This is how we treated our employee. Those are what you call moments of leadership. Look for them. Search them out. When I was commissioned in Vermont, I walked into an office. There was a, a girl that had, sitting on a chair, she had four wheels, one of the wheels was missing, and they had a block of wood there so she wouldn't fall over. Can you imagine that? We don't think about you so much, 
that we're not even going to give you a good chair to sit on. Now, <clears throat> all of the energy that that employee has that could give to the organization, they take it outside. They become chess players, hunters, you name it. They take that energy, and instead of giving it, because you know what the, the department says? We don't give a shit about you. And you know what the employee says? I don't give a shit about the organization. I says, gee, that's, that's one heck of a chair. I says, uh, go to the warden's office and switch chairs with the warden. I'm sure he's got a very nice chair. Well, she comes down the hallway with a big leather tufted chair. And she says, I don't want to get in trouble. I said, I'm the commissioner. You're not going to get in trouble. Switch chairs. He comes back. He says, hey, commissioner, what happened to my chair? I said, you let uh, somebody who works for you sit in a chair like that. You know what that says? We don't care about you. You know what the employee says? I don't care about the organization. He's going to sit in that chair until you find her a better one. Well, the, about two weeks later, I went to my first cabinet meeting, and the governor's chief of staff said he's going to go to every commissioner and you know, tell him something to make him feel good. So uh, you do that. You know, you, you, when you're in Rome, like President Bush said, said, when you're in Rome, do as the Romanians do. So um, I said I wasn't going to do that, but... Where the hell was I? Oh, so, so the, 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 the governor goes to me and he says, uh, Anthony, my new commissioner, how are you doing? I says, nothing to report, governor. I just found the men's room the other day, so I'm there too long. He says, yeah, you're taking any more chairs away from people? And he smiled. Well, why wouldn't he smile? Suggestions went up. Sick leave went down. See the impact of that? So I have learned now not to let those come to me. You know what they say, never waste a crisis. I go out looking for those things where I can communicate by gesture that what I do first is I take care of the people who work for me. Here comes another one. Do you take care of the people who work for you? You heard that? Hate their boss? I said that. Organizations are driven by people. The people your organ, uh, uh, in your organization are tools and you have to learn how to use them. They all have the strength. Oh, we don't have, I'm gonna. I like to tell stories because um, I want to get to something else. Stumbling blocks. You'll find stumbling blocks in an organization. They're really stepping stones. The stumbling blocks let you use them as stepping stones to better achievement. Learn how to use, learn how to use those stumbling blocks around. Now I had, when I was a young detective in Brooklyn, my boss sent me to pick up his laundry at a Chinese laundromat. Here I am in a police car doing something personal for my boss. Now look at the position I was put in. So when I got there, I told the Chinese uh, uh, launder, I said, do me a favor, cut off all of the buttons on this shirt and replace them with bigger buttons that can't go through the hole. Is that Sicilian in me? It's, you know. He says, why do you want to do that? Well, $10 uh, corrected his curiosity. Now, he never asked me to do anything for him again, and I would give a year's salary to see this guy put his shirts on in the morning. So look at these things as, and not, not only that, but I fixed it for everybody else that were called to, uh, uh, people don't get people to work, people get people to want to work. What is that 
in their makeup that they get people to want to work. Do you do that? I told you that I was going to pepper this talk and ask you questions that you ask yourself. How do you get people to want to work? I talked to you about the pizza, trading with mistake. There are other things you can do, okay, that helps along. I don't have any meetings until 4 o'clock. You can't meet with me until 4 o'clock. I have 20 meetings between 4 and 5. Because people are fast at 4 o'clock. At 9.30, they want to sit down, they want a cup of coffee. <laughs> so I fix that up. <laughs> I fix that up by taking all of the chairs out of my office. Are you all right, Miss? And there's no chairs in my office. So sometimes you'll get, where do your guests sit? And I said, they don't. They state their business and they leave. <laughs> I have stand-up meetings. I got shortcuts, OK? I constantly tell people, you're going a long way around the barn. Four o'clock meeting. You will move the goalpost. You will achieve more in lesser time. Because anybody who's spending more than 25% of their calendar time in their office is screwing up. How am I doing with time here? This is my, my uncle's watch. It means a lot to me. He gave it to me on his deathbed for $40. It's a shame you never get a chance to cash that check. Um, <laughs> coaches and conductors, they get the very best of people. If you're going to pick a style, you're going to pick a Joe DiMaggio style, a Lee Iacocca style. A, uh, uh, you're going to pick a style, Now, the fact that they happen to be Italian has nothing to do with this, but anyway, what you're going to do is pick a style of leadership. You want to get the best out of people. Now remember, the people who work for you are saying, I'm only working at 60% of capacity. I'm telling you how to get 40% more out of what you have, okay? Uh, one of the things that I do every year is it's a good management device where people contribute is I do a needs assessment. What is the needs of this department? I conduct, we sit down and we talk about the needs of the department in training, in budgeting, whatever it might be. I remember in Brooklyn we had a map with 275 unsolved murders. And the boss said to me, any suggestions? And I said, yes. Get more pins. <laughs> I'll say that again, because some of you didn't get it. Get more pins. Now, if he would have did a needs assessment, he would have found out what the needs were of the homicide squad, the training, the forensic. And let me tell you something. We had probably one of the best forensic units in, in the country, I remember we found a foot in a mailbox, and within three days, they were able to identify it. Now, the fact that it had a return address on it had absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> All right. Coaches. Take care of your people. This is the broken chair, okay? That's the broken chair. That's the locker room. This is how we treated the people who work for us. You got that sound up? That's the old locker room. That's the warden.
that's the new locker room. That's her new chair. That's the new locker room. Now, again, let me say it again, that you actually take care of the people who work for you. One of the ways of getting people to contribute to your organization is the needs assessment. I do that every year. That needs assessment, people come forward, you give them a place in the organization. They tell you what they think. They tell you what they think. Now, probably the number one skill you should have as a leader is the ability to think on your feet. Do you have that ability to think on your feet? I got it when I was 12 years old. I worked in a grocery store. A man came in and he says, I want to buy a half a grapefruit. I says, look, mister, we don't, you gotta buy the whole thing. We don't, we don't cut grapefruits. He said, listen, you little punk, you gotta remember, this was Brooklyn. I don't want to get my ass kicked for a grapefruit. So I said, well, <laughs> let me speak to the manager. Let me, maybe he'll let me cut it and I can sell you a half. So I walked to the back of the store with the grapefruit and the owner was sat on a little desk and he says, what's up, Anthony? Uh, unbeknown to me, the man quietly and secretly followed right behind. He said, what's up, Anthony? I said, some ass <laughs> wants to buy a half a grapefruit. I turned and he was standing right there. And I said, and this gentleman would like to buy the other half. <laughs> so, one of the things that leaders do is they can think on their feet. Again, here's another one coming at you. Are you the type of person that could think on your feet and think fast? That is a skill you can develop. Leaders think on their feet. A lot of times you'll say, I have a gut reaction to things. It's not your gut. Your gut is years based on experience. So they call it your gut reaction. Your gut reaction, every day you spend in a job, every day you spend in an organization, you gain things that you don't even know that you're gaining. That stuff goes into your gut. So when you have a gut reaction, my advice is to take it. Number two, I don't know if we're gonna to get to that slide, leaders are creative people. Now creativity has become its own discipline. You must learn how to become creative people. Now, when are you most creative? Let me go around the room. When are you most creative? Somebody tell me when you're most creative. Huh? 4 a.m., okay. Early. Driving. How many people driving? Taking a shower. Okay, the point I want to make is, if you want to be creative, get into your creative bag. Okay? Now, I become creative when I watch television commercials. So I taped an hour's worth of television commercials. What are you laughing at? That works for me. And I watch television commercials when I want to be creative, okay? It gives me a practical sense. Sometimes, it, with me, it makes me more practical. You know, NASA spent $4 million to develop a pen that would write under zero gravity for the astronauts. 
the Russians gave their astronauts a pencil. One of my heroes, one of my heroes is a man who built buildings on a college campus. And after he built the, 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 uh, uh, the buildings, he didn't put in the sidewalk. Built a cluster of buildings. And they kept on telling him, when are you going to come back and put the sidewalk? He says, I'll get there. And they kept on, when are you going to put, and he said, I'll get there. He kept on delaying it. Well, he finally came back and he looked at where the people walked between the buildings. And that's where he put the sidewalks. Why? Because it was user friendly and it worked. I am a fan of what works. I do a lot of talking to police departments and sheriff's offices. There's a great study called the What Works Study, which should be the Bible today for law enforcement. It is not. I can't tell you how many police chiefs and sheriffs do not know what's going on in their own business because they don't know what works. We're, 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 we're doing the wrong things with greater conviction. The D.A.R.E. program doesn't work. Scared straight doesn't work. The research has proven it, and yet government is doing the same things. The same is true in your business. What's working in education? Now that work study was broken up into what works, what doesn't, what's promising. The same should be true in every one of your disciplines. What's working in school? What's working on education? Now I've been in the classroom 40 years. I see things that are not working. Okay, I mean simply not, not working. Uh, you, you, the kids come into class, you give them 70% of that, you, they take a subject, you give, you give them 70% of that, they study 60% of that, you test them on 80% of that, they get 70% of that, a year later they say, did I take that course? What are we doing in the classrooms? Time has come to change your mindset. I want to get to the things that... Uh, time comes to uh, foster an environment where coaching is capital to success. Give them a pleasant experience at work. You know, I learned that in biology. In high school, about a pleasant experience. <clears throat> we put two wires into this mouse when he touched this blue button, he got something that was akin to a sexual experience. When he touched the red button, he got food. Now my mouse lost two and a half pounds. <laughs> I said I wasn't gonna do that, but it, I really love it. <laughs> so, if you give employees a pleasant experience, let them achieve, here's the big one, here's the big one, move the goalpost. Move the goalpost, move the goalpost. They achieve more. Watch, I'm making a U-turn. That only happens with impatient leaders. Impatient leaders, move the goalpost, move the goalpost, okay? I'm sorry about this, but I want to get to so much, and I, I, I'm down to uh, a, a few minutes, I guess. What time do I have to, what, how much more time do I have? Well, nobody's answering me, so. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover, I told you that story. I put the lipstick on him. The speed of the boss is the speed of the team. When I get into a car and I'm going 60 miles an hour, everybody in that car is going 60 miles an hour. Do you have people running along the side of the car? No, you certainly do. Now, you tell them, we have two choices here. It's my way or it's my way. 
Now, I had a detective who worked for me in New York who was a pompadour. He was, none of the other detectives wanted to work for him, with him, okay? And everybody wanted me to transfer him, but he was good around kids. If I had to interview a kid, I would send him in the room, he'd come in, and I wanted to keep that skill in the squad. So one day I got so tired of hearing complaints about him that I sent him to Carnegie Hall. My wife doesn't like this story. Uh, and I said, uh, go to Carnegie Hall, I want you to go see the manager. I want a detective there when I speak to the manager. He said, uh, okay, so he gets there, he calls me, he says, I got the manager, I'm in the manager's office. What do you want me to ask him? I said, ask him for a job. He said, what? I said, ask him for a job, because all of the prima donnas work at Carnegie Hall, they don't work for me. And I hung up. Well, it must have been a long drive back to the office. <laughs> Knocked on the door, he said, can I talk to you? I said, yeah, what's up? He said, I guess I needed that. I said, yeah, you needed that. You needed a lesson. I said, you're gonna get a helmet, you're gonna get on a team, you're gonna get in the game, you're gonna get out. And he was okay. So leaders, 15 minutes? Okay. So, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna bore you for another 15 minutes, but we're gonna go quick. Um, what do you see um, when you look at, no, I wanna go back to that. Does this thing go back? Go back to the pig on the road. What, what do you see when you look at problems? Do you see threats or you see opportunities? Conflict is an opportunity in disguise. Conflict is an opportunity in disguise. What do you see when you see conflict? What do you see when you see conflict? Go forward. Go forward. What do you see when you see conflict? Conflict, an opportunity in disguise. Now, do you see the threat or you see the opportunity? Do you see the threat, leave it there, or do you see the opportunity? What do you see? I was driving down the road with a sports car. A big Buick came, came at me and a woman yelled at the window. She said, pig. I said, cow. You yell at me, I yell at you. <clears throat> About a hundred feet later, I hit a loose pig on the road. You see, I only heard the threat. I didn't see the opportunity. Many leaders only see threats. They don't see the opportunity. They see conflict, but conflict is an opportunity in disguise. That was the pig thing that didn't work well, all right. Are you a patient person? Get out, I already said get out to you. Learn to be impatient. Challenge the rules. The most important thing that leaders do, they challenge the rules. Do you challenge your rules? Challenging the rules are in our way. Here's a person that challenged the rules. Little, little old lady in the back of a bus. Challenge the rules. Change the culture. Challenge the rules. That's what we have to do now. In police work, it's particularly hard because everybody thinks a lot. It's hard to get police officers sometimes to think differently because it's the biggest club in the world. Lodas, Lodas, toujours Lodas, daring, daring. Leaders are daring, are you daring? How many of you would go back and change your what you're doing if you weren't afraid of getting in trouble? Raise your hand. Okay, that means you gotta let people own their job. You gotta let people own their job. How many people 
here have rented a car? Raise your hand. Lower your hand. How many people here have washed a rented car? I got clean freaks here. They're screwing up my point. <laughs> All right. You don't take wash a rented car because you don't own it. If you're going to give somebody a job in your organization, let them own it. When I get appointed to something, that's my only, my only demand. Elbow room. I own this job. When you give somebody a job, let them own it. All right, this is a great movie, something the Lord made. He said something in that movie that said, you can't touch the heart, that's the rule. We're going to challenge the rules. And that doctor and that carpenter, this guy was a carpenter, okay, helped him uh, with dogs, they took hearts out, and they replaced hearts. That was never done before. Why? Because that guy challenged the rules. Citizen Kane challenged the rules. The greatest movie ever made challenged the rules about movie making. Danny Kay challenged the rules. Every advance because someone challenged the rules. What's going on back there? Will we stuck in neutral here? <laughs> Beethoven, challenge the rules. Do you challenge the rules or do, are you stuck in neutral? about your organization. How much time do you devote to challenging the rules? Conflict, an opportunity in disguise. Conflict, an opportunity in disguise. I'm gonna go fast now. All right, we need to look at partnerships with people. We're doing that today. This is the pig story that taught me that uh, you should know what it cost me to put that in there. This is not, as you could see, this is not a canned presentation. I hit the pig. <laughs> Creativity. Creativity comes from people outside the organization. You must talk to people outside your organization. Talk to people inside your organization. They all think alike, so there's not a lot of thinking going on. You must talk to butchers, judges, plumbers. It's one thing about law enforcement. We're the biggest club in the world. We keep ourselves to ourselves. Bad, bad practice. Creativity came from people outside the industry. Talk to people, leaders, talk to people outside the industry. The enemy of the creative process is the conforming environment. That's the enemy of the creative process. Always look for the second right answer. Always look for the, some guy come up with an idea, he says, I want to put gunpowder in my paint. So the next time uh, I have to paint the house, I'll just light the paint and it'll blow off the old paint. So someone says, that's not a good idea. Why don't you put a chemical in there so you can add her a second chemical that'll loosen it up. Now, he's the hero because that was his idea, not to me. The hero is the guy that says, let's put gunpowder in the paint. The question is, nobody wants to say something stupid like that in front of their boss. So I take that rule. I, make, I say the stupid thing 
so that people could piggyback because I'm looking for the second right answer. Someone is going to take my stupidity and build on it and come up with a second good idea. So the hero is in your organization, if you have one, is to say, let's put, is the guy who says, let's put gunpowder in the paint. My favorite singer is Fats Domino. Uh, we had a big drug raid that was going to happen on Monday. And one of the detectives came in early and he says, I couldn't wait to get here. Uh, on the way home that night, I was listening to Fats Domino and a movie was uh, Blue Monday. Now what was it about Fats Domino talking about people going to work and it was Blue Monday. And this guy who worked for me saying I couldn't wait to get here. What was it about those two? That's why my book is called Leadership for the Soul, Thank God It's Monday. Because that's what he said, okay? Thank God. By the way, his name is Frank Sinatra. That was his name. Could you imagine this guy having to go through life with a name like Frank Sinatra? One day I called him by me. I called the wrong number, and his mother-in-law lived with him, and I dialed the wrong number, and I said, is Frank Sinatra there? And the woman on the phone says, honey, I wish he was. <laughs> a bad word for good, here's my pizza. Try it, you'll like it. Pizza, the word mistake, a bad word for a good try that didn't make it. And that's what they say, I made a pizza. Some mistakes can hurt you. Hit that. <coughs> Go back. They got to see this. Okay. <laughs> I told you this wasn't a canned program. Some mistakes can hurt you. Watch out for those mistakes <laughs> that, that, that can hurt you. Now sometimes I want to go to what I think is be a talent hunter. five minutes. Sometimes we forget what we are in business for. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, you create the basic metabolism in the organization. You create that. You create that basic metabolism. Your vision is so compelling that people want to be a part of it. Your vision is so compelling that people want to be a part of it. This is the last one. I'm sorry. We forget what we're in this thing. A bus company went out of business because they couldn't maintain their schedules. The reason why they couldn't maintain their schedules was because they had to stop and pick up passengers. They forgot what they were in business for. Do you forget what you are in business for? One of my favorite things, Faulty Towers. He runs this hotel in England. He could run this hotel perfectly if it wasn't for the guests. 
He forgets what he's in business for. Well, I'm going to leave you now because my time is up. But I am going to leave you with one, one little story. A doctor in Ohio had taken care of the four poor people for 50 years. His office was over a barn. It said, Dr. Sorensen, his own sign on the barn door said, Dr. Sorensen upstairs. After 50 years of taking care of the poor, he died, and the poor people wanted to get together and build them a monument. They didn't have the money. They felt terrible. So they took the sign off his door, and they put it on his grave. And it said, Dr. Sorensen, upstairs. Now, if you think about that, it says, it's not your journey, it's your destination. So, have a good destination. Thank you for uh, letting me come and speak. I'm sorry you had to do it shortly, but have a good conference, and thank you again. I don't know if I hit the time, it says 10.15.